Hi, I'm Nob. You might already know me from my Hack the Box and Try Hack Me walkthroughs that I publish on the website. In this video and the upcoming ones, we'll tackle exploit development for the Windows user land and create our very own exploits for practice binaries and real world applications. After installing WinDebug and IDA and downloading Wuln server from GitHub, we are ready to go and we'll start with static analysis. Before doing anything, we head over to options and enable line prefixes. This will display the memory addresses in front of the assembly instructions. Since this is a remote and not a local exploit, we have to somehow send data to the Wuln server application. On the left side in the functions list, we can see an entry for the receive function, which belongs to the WinSock library. As the name implies, this function can be used to receive data and might be a good starting point for us. To perform a cross-reference search, we can double-click the entry, mark the function and hit Ctrl X. The results window shows that it only gets called once in the entire application. Double-clicking the one result we got will move us to the corresponding location in the assembly code. Right here we see a call to receive and afterwards a comparison whether the function call was successful. The Microsoft documentation for the WinSock receive function states that if no error occurs, receive returns the number of bytes received and the buffer pointed to by the buff parameter will contain this data received. If the connection has been gracefully closed, the return value is zero. Right here we move EAX, the CPU register that contains return values, into a local variable and then compare that variable with zero. If the local variable is less than or equal to zero, the green path will be taken. Following that path and taking a look at the displayed strings, connection closing and receive failed with error, shows that this is indeed not the path we want to take. Going back to the previous node in IDA, we assume that the receive call was successful and follow the red path. The next node contains a call to string compare as well as the three required parameters for the function call. IDA helps us by displaying comments for known parameters and displaying strings as well as offset names that could indicate the use of the variable. First, we have the max count, which in this case is 5. This means that the first five characters of the supplied strings will be compared. Next, we have the string help with a white space, which appears to be a static string and also has the length of exactly five characters. Afterwards, we have two move instructions. Taking an educated guess after looking at the offset name buff, we can assume that this string contains the buffer that was sent to the application. Finally, after calling string compare, test eax eax and the jump not zero instruction are used to decide which code path to take. If the first five characters of the buffer indeed contained help, the red path is taken, otherwise we will follow the green one. Following the green ones shows that there are various comparisons with the strings inside the binary. In this video, we focus on the TRUN implementation. Assuming that we pass the comparison in the TRUN node, we follow the red path to a node that allocates memory using malloc and memset. Following that code path further leads to a loop, which we are going to analyze more in depth using dynamic analysis. For now, it seems like it's moving through some kind of buffer and compares each byte with hex 2e, which corresponds to a dot in ASCII text. When exiting the loop without ever passing the comparison, the execution flow gets moved to a basic block that contains a trunk completed message. On the other hand, when passing the check, the execution flow gets moved to a basic block that contains a string copy function. This function should pique our interest as it might be vulnerable to a buffer overflow. Take a note of the count variable, which is hex bb8. Converted to decimal, this value is 3000 and might indicate the size of our payload we have to send to the application. Before moving on to dynamic analysis, let's take a note of the address for the comparison with the tran string and the address for the byte comparison within the loop. For the dynamic analysis, we are going to start WinDebug and open the application. 
Next, let's set a breakpoint on the address that points to the comparison with the trun string using the bp command. After doing so, we can resume the execution with g. Switching to the Linux machine, I prepared a Python script that sends the wood wood string to the application. In this case, the first command line argument is used to provide either an IP address or a host name. After executing the script and moving back to the Windows machine, we can see that the breakpoint at the string compare function got triggered. In the disassembly window, we can see the function arguments being moved around. First, we got the max count, which is 5, moved to ESP plus 8. Next, something static is moved to ESP plus 4. We can assume that it's something static like a string because of the naming offset wollen server plus offset. Finally, we got something moved into EAX from EBP minus 10 and then moved into ESP. Using the DA command, which dumps memory in ASCII format, we can take a look at ESP and ESP plus 4. POI is used to dereference the address as we don't want to dump the address stored in ESP itself. The output shows that the first five characters of our wood wood string are being compared with trun. This means that the first five characters of the buffer we sent are some kind of prefix used to determine the code path to take. To ease the process of our dynamic analysis, we can modify our buffer in memory using the ea command to pass the check. Before resuming the execution flow, let's set a breakpoint at the byte comparison inside the loop we discovered earlier. Right here we see a byte comparison between the first byte EAX points to and hex2e which corresponds to a dot in ASCII. Since we already know what hex2e is, let's take a look at what EAX points to to reveal the other part of the comparison. For that we can use the db command and provide EAX as the memory address. This shows that the comparison takes place between our buffer and the static value provided. Essentially, this means that if we want to reach the string copy function, our buffer has to contain a dot. For now, we can clear all breakpoints and resume the execution flow. Going back to our Python script, we can set the prefix, add a dot to our buffer to pass the check, and create a pattern string. The pattern string can be used to calculate the exact offset for the instruction pointer override in case we are actually able to override the EIP using it. After executing the Python script again and switching back to WinDebug, we see that the instruction pointer was indeed overwritten and an access violation occurred. The value currently stored in EIP originates from our pattern string, meaning we can calculate the exact offset for the override using MSF pattern offset. After finding the offset for the EIP override, we have to check for potential bad characters. Bad characters are characters that somehow mangle your buffer or shellcode. One common bad character would be the null byte, which acts as a string terminator. Other common ones would be hex0a and hex0d in web applications, as they represent the carriage return and the new line character. To check for such characters, we simply send each character from 00 to ff to the application. Since we can assume that the null byte is a bad char, we can skip that one. Before executing our Python script, we have to restart the application in WinDebug and resume the execution flow. After executing the script, we can use the dd command to inspect the stack. The option L40 describes the amount of bytes we want to dump from the stack. Since there are no bad chars in Wollen Server except the string terminator, every character we sent landed on the stack. 
After confirming that there are no further bad chores, we have to think about how we want to redirect the execution flow. The previous step not only showed that there are no other bad characters, but also that we are able to place data on the stack. This means that we can place our shellcode on the stack and override the instruction pointer with an address that points to a jump ESP or call ESP instruction. This kind of instruction would then effectively redirect the execution flow to the stack where our shellcode resides. To find such an instruction, we first have to know the corresponding CPU opcodes. This can be done using the MSF NASM shell. Back in WinDebug, we can list all modules used by Wuln server using alum. Since the address of the Wuln server binary starts with 00, we cannot look for an address here. Remember that 00 equals the string terminator, which is a bad character. Sfunk, on the other hand, does not start with a null byte, so we can search in its address space instead. This command will iterate through the memory and look for the byte sequence FFE4. We can take the first address and replace our EIP variable in the Python script with it. The final step is to create some shellcode. For now, we will simply use msfvenom to generate some shellcode for us. Of course, we could generate shellcode to catch a reverse shell, but a simple proof of concept of remote code execution is sufficient for this scenario. We use the windows slash exec payload with the cmd argument set to calc.exe to open a calculator. We also specify the bad characters found, which in this case is only the null byte. The exit function is set to threads so that the application does not crash and we could re-exploit it. Ignore all the error messages, they occur in the most up-to-date version of Kali Linux, though msfvenom still works fine. Before executing our final version of the exploit, we have to prepend a bunch of knobs to the shellcode. Since the shellcode was encoded to get rid of the specified bad character, a decoder stop was added to the shellcode. Those knobs are basically just for the decoder stop to have some place so it doesn't overwrite anything on the stack. Finally, we can execute our proof of concept. And when taking a look at the Windows machine, we see that we actually got remote code execution and popped a calculator. That's it for part 1. In the next video, we are going to exploit the second Wuln server command using an SEH-based overflow.